Các vị đã biết con đường tóc xa Kim Quang Chú Who is the current director of the Municipal Office Bangkok The Bangkok Office in charge of the broader sense of Asia Including Western Asia Central Asia, North Asia, Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Pacific. Is that the fullest? Okay. And before he joined the UNESCO, he worked in the Korean government as the Vice Minister of Education and Human Resources. And he actually, at one, he, at one time, he headed the, uh, the program on ICT in education. And we, when we are all amazed about the uh, advancement of uh, technology and education learning in Korea. He is one of the architects. Uh, he is a student, he's a graduate of uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, mid career actually, before, after he worked in the uh, president's office. Uh, for the benefit of time, I will not read out the long list of his uh, CVs, but without further ado, may I invite her. Uh, uh, J, uh, G.J., we call him G.J., to come forward. Good morning. Actually, I'm very pleased and honored to be here on the stage. This is a very tough task to begin a big conference like this. But again, uh, I'm very honored. Before I get started, uh, <clears throat> let me express my sincere thanks to the host university, Hong Kong U, and the government of Hong Kong for having me in this important forum. My special thanks goes to two professors, Professor Nancy Lo and Professor Kai Ming Chang. Um, they forced me to be here, although <laughs> I don't undertake any research myself. But again, I'm here uh, for, I think, a couple of reasons. Since I'm from the policy background, with that, I have some experience in deploying technology in education in my own country. For another, since I'm leading uh, the UNESCO office in Bangkok, which is our Asia-Pacific Regional Bureau for Education, covering 46 member states in the region. Uh, as Kai Ming mentioned, uh, we cover different part of Asia and Pacific, including Far East Asia, uh, Japan, my country, Korea, and Mongolia, China, etc. <coughs> so, when I was asked to speak before distinguished academics and participants, I was thinking what kind of story would be relevant to the conference. So I have decided to speak <coughs> from my own experience. Uh, what is how the policymakers would see this issue of CSCL, the using technology in education? What might be relevant policy? Uh, issues and trends. So based on that, I consulted my colleagues to construct my storyline. But before that, uh, listening to uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Chui, you mentioned about the widening learning space for <coughs> students, both physical and digi digital space. So I was wondering, in regards to the topic of this conference, is this decision backed up by research or knowledge? Do we have enough evidence to suggest that this expanding, widening uh, physical and digital space will augment student learning of all kinds? I'm just, as I was wondering, because the topic is linking research and decision on the one hand, and linking technology and education. So having this in mind, again, my storyline is this. So I'm going to introduce to you what might be salient trends that we might attend to when we, within, in the context of, again, CSCL and 
how I ICT education is evolving. I'm not going to in looking into all the details, but just picking up few uh, important trends to illustrate uh, what might be a relevant question that we might raise at the end of the day. And then I will address this area, one might call unknown. Despite all the research, we are still left <coughs> to wonder how and if as technology can increase student learning of all kinds, not just PISA type of uh, learning, but as Kaiming mentioned, the new kind of learning to, to be able to adapt to ever-changing world, climate change, uh, health issues, you name it, uh, disaster, conflict, and whether our youngsters are being prepared for this ever-changing world. So are these skills are observed and measured? This is another domain. But the important thing is, perhaps we need to identify what is known and what is not known. Then I will talk about, so given all this, what we, UNESCO, is doing in this area. And I will conclude with a couple of points. I understand I'm given half an hour timing which means I can have my time until 10.20. Is it okay? Thank you. But, so within the next half an hour, as I proceed, if you have any uh, questions, clarification in particular, please raise your hand, and I will uh, try to make my point clear. So I'm looking at the two trends when it comes to ICT, <coughs> ICT mostly from economic standpoint because we, one can talk about social and other impacts but for, for, when it comes to economics we have uh, so many economists who do a lot of macro uh, study to look into the impact of ICT on individuals and also on, uh, on system. So I'm going to look into uh, some important trends. So how technology in general, I see Timpak change the labor market. Uh, this might not be a <coughs> very representative sample. Nevertheless, uh, this is, by the way, from U.S. What this graph tells us is in the industrial uh, of the labor occupations, the medium skill, even wage jobs are disappearing or shrinking. This is happening in many economies, not just in the U.S., in Europe and many countries. Some countries they say as well. So, so why is this happening? Because another way of looking at this is the, the earnings or wage bill share by skill group. If we break down the three skill group, the medium school people are less well paid off, whereas the high skill and low skill, all the groups are in a way maintaining their economic standing or improving even. Many examples we three people. Uh, this is um, a bit more clear in terms of earnings associated with uh, some kind of technical skills. Are you following me? Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so what is, is, is this one is telling us this? Uh, for those who have more or less the same uh, qualification in terms of education and others, those who have some additional skills like a computer and mathematics, <clears throat> those who work in computer and mathematics occupations, obviously these are the occupations that need lots of te technological skills they are uh, better remunerated. This is in a nutshell what this graph is telling. One can replace this uh, uh, blue uh, line with the high school graduates and the red line with college grade or something. So the message here is that if you have possessed skills, particularly technology related skills, you are uh, more likely to be in a better paid jobs.
like computer and mathematics occupations. Okay, so why is this happening? Part of the reason may be the nature of job, the nature of work in the real world is changing in a dramatic fashion. So that now, nowadays, the tasks that require non-routine analytic, non-routine intellectual skills are on high demand, well as tasks that require routine manual, routine cognitive, non-routine manual uh, work are decreasing. So this corresponds to the, the earlier graph that I showed you. So perhaps this non-routine analytic, non-routine intellect may be the kind of skills that can be delivered through CSCL. I am still struggling with this abbreviation, CSCL, sorry about that. Computer supported collaborative learning. So these are the kind of skills that one can deliver through CSCL, if you agree. Am I making my point clear? I was going to update this chart because some of you may have seen this chart elsewhere. The Monain, uh, by the way, uh, happened to be my uh, mentor many years back, so I'm using his uh, research finding. By the way, this is in US again, uh, most, uh, <clears throat> mostly from banking sector. Nevertheless, the Macy's, uh, we can find a similar trend in other lucrative professions. And you, one doesn't need a rocket science to understand it. I mean, if you look around, you will immediately recognize the high-paying, high-skilled jobs are requiring these kind of high-old skills. Again, this can be delivered or, best or better delivered through CSCL. That's why I'm emphasizing this. Now, this is at the story at the individual level. What is happening at the system level? Over the years, in the beginning, let's say uh, early 90s, as you may know, some of you may know, there was a debate about whether investment in ICT will bring uh, economic returns or benefits, considering the uh, massive amount of money required in building infrastructure and others. But by now, this debate, as far as I know, is completely gone, because why? One can clearly see in uh, OECD countries, for example, the, uh, the benefit in terms of economic growth, contribution to economic growth, one clearly see between two periods in time, 1990 and 1995, where many countries start to invest in ICT. By uh, the next period, 1995 and 2002, you can see the blue chart. This is the the extent of investment in ICT's contribution to GDP growth is a bit uh, technical, but <clears throat> simply what it means is that uh, the investment in ICT contributes a lot to economic growth in these OECD economies. We are speaking about, in case of Sweden, for example, 0.9 percent is for its contribution. If you think about average annual growth, about 3 percent, more or less 3 percent is uh, pretty high, right? <clears throat> so what about the different technologies? When it comes to modality or the uh, type of technology, we can see that the investment in broadband technology pays off a lot compared to fixed line approach or mobile or even internet. More so for developing countries than developed economies. So this is uh, uh, somewhat positive, but on the negative side, we, <clears throat> we are seeing the gap between the haves and the haves not is growing between countries and within countries. I'm only show, showing you the um, countries at the unit of analysis. As you can see, the between developed and developing world, as, as the gap is widening as time goes by. So, with this backdrop, so let's take a quick look at what is happening in education at the global and regional scene. Um, over the last decade, couple of decades, there has been significant increase 
uh, uh, improvement in terms of expanding educational opportunities at the global level. For instance, back in 1999, uh, there were more than 100 million students out of school. By 2007, as you all can see, this number has dropped to 72 million. If we project this trend into the future by the 2015, which is the target year for achieving education for all, we still have many kids out of school. So what are we going to do about it? This is why the international organization, together with NESCOM, are uh, working so keenly on this agenda of education for all. But this is uh, about access. What about the uh, learning? Um, we have uh, more than several very uh, well-known international assessments, including TIMSS and PISA. So let's take, for example, using the TIMSS data. Uh, we can see that there are In the back, can you see this? OK. Anyway, uh, it looks very complicated, but the message we can get from here is there is considerable gap between countries and within countries in terms of uh, learning measured in, in the area of math. So how ICT? can improve this situation, one obvious case that we can make immediately is access of widening up the opportunity. Indeed, in a gigantic country, India, they have very well-developed open school system catering to the needs of uh, uh, primary school graduates, those who wanting to work in uh, different jobs. So they, are, <clears throat> they have a 16 centers by now, and about 2,300 centers all over India, and provide secondary, senior secondary, and vocational programs. As of 2011, more than 1.5 million students are enrolled in these various programs. The majority of these are enrolled in secondary program. So, one might think that for any government to accommodate 1.8 million students, how many schools do you have to construct? It will be very, very difficult and uh, time consuming and a huge resource may be required. But at the relatively less resources, we can at least provide entry level educational opportunities. So ICT clearly expands Opportunities. In case of Pakistan, if you look at this uh, uh, chart to the right, two uh, open universities or virtual universities, heavily relying on technology, are accommodating three quarters of all students in tertiary, tertiary education. How can this be? Uh, how can you arrive at this same results with the conventional approach? It's impossible. So, a very clear example. I know many of you where well, we have many cases from in my country, but this clearly illustrates how ICT can expand uh, learning or space for kids who otherwise cannot be in schools in the first place. So, let me turn to them. So, what is happening to them? the learning outcome or quality of learning. Learning. We had, as Professor Cheng and Lo mentioned, that we had uh, this two-day uh, Back to Learning Forum. I happened to be, uh, I had a, a privilege of being a part of the group. So we were debating about how to bring learning in the foreground of education enterprises. And Collectively, we agreed on five bullet points, one of which, which maybe a couple of which are related to, again, CSCL, using technology, building uh, a community of practitioners. But bringing learning to the foreground means that we focus on learning, and that focus on key uh, learning on <clears throat> in key competency areas. So nobody would disagree that math is one such key area. 
okay? So if you look at the, uh, the use of <coughs> the length of time using computer on the one hand and math science score, as you can see, it's hard to read from this uh, graph, but in a nutshell, what this tells us is that uh, stu for students who used more than five years, score, uh, their scores are much higher than students who use <coughs> excuse me, computers only one, two, three years. So clearly there is a strong link association between use of computer on the one hand and the math score. How about, I'm oh, sorry, this is science. Jong, is this science, right? What about math, another important domain of uh, uh, key skills? we find a similar trend. This is presented in different way. I don't know why OECD analysts did this, but this is the graph that we uh, get from OECD report, my colleague. Thank you for this. We see the same pattern. Now, um, so again, this is confirmed by another uh, research. This is a weather survey done by World Economic Forum back in 2008. As you can see, uh, technology readiness or network readiness on the one hand and the math and science education in country schools. As you can see, the strong relationship. So the question is, how is this happening? How can this, uh, what is the process whereby students get better and uh, more learning? Through ICT and education. So I have a puzzle here. So when we break this trend into smaller pieces, we decompose this trend, we find a very str strange, uh, I don't know whether we can call it findings. So use of computer at home and math performance, so the overall trend is maintained here, meaning that the frequent users score higher, okay? Use of computer at schools, no difference. What does that mean? If you use computer at home, you, you tend to learn more. What is it? I'm puzzled. So we were discussing this last night with my colleagues. We were not able to answer the question. I'm sure that the OECD analysts, they, do not, they may not have the answer. We, sh we better check with them later. Now, here is a study, a follow-up study, the, a group of German researchers by the name of Wittwell and uh, Senk Bell in 2008. They uh, break this data, f <coughs> um, they looked into data further to see if they can find any clue. So here's what they come up, a couple of points. Student access to computer and focus was not significantly linked with their performance in mathematics. A positive, however, a positive effect was observed for a small group of students who used the computer in problem solving activities. I don't know what it means, but it's something like a collaborative learning or teaching. Uh, something individuals cannot achieve without help of teachers and uh, peer students, I believe. Um, this may require what, uh, as a uh, under Secretary Mr. Chen mentioned the engagement, maybe engagement, rather than sitting in, rather than being obedient, compliant. By the way, this is happening in, in this part of the world, in many classrooms, you can see that students are not raising questions in the first place, and teachers are not encouraging. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but from my own observation, from my own knowledge, this is still uh, the, the major trend. So. Th Perhaps one implication that we can get from this uh, analysis would be for us to engage both teachers and students in what we call collaborative learning assisted by computer and other technology. So, so lots of things are unknown. I, I know I have only 10 minutes left. Can I spend one, only five minutes? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so in, uh, the recent UNESCO report says that education policy makers and decision makers frequently have little or no information about effectiveness of ICT in schools 
And this is, and OECD also says that far too much research and learning is disconnected from the realities of educational practice and policy making. So we all know that. This is, this is only reconfirmation of our knowledge. So what is unknown? In terms of pedagogy, the two elements, the two key elements to quality learning, pedagogy and assessment, we are, uh, we are left to wonder what kind of advice we can get, I mean, from policy perspective, from research circle. Pedagogy, what is the right, for example, ICT competence skills to enhance or deliver collaborative learning or student-centered constructive learning process outcome? And how do we assess so-called 21st century skills? Do we do paper and tense, what do you call it? paper and tensor multiple choice test? Maybe not. Then what? What kind of instruments are available are more effective than others? So if conventional approach doesn't work, what are the alternatives? Still, we are wondering the measurement and approach to 21st century skills. The case of Singapore is very interesting because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by looking at the policy document, it says that they put researchers in the middle ground, in between policymakers and actors, meaning students and teachers. So these policy researchers are supposed to interpret the policies on the one hand, and also they are observing, analyzing what is happening in real classroom situation, so that they can analyze and uh, you know, uh, giving feedback to both groups. I think this is the, their intention by putting research at the meso level. I thought we need this other intermediaries like us, international organization, others, consultants, to, to, to uh, broker between the two different groups. But in case of Singapore, it's very interesting. I don't know in reality if this is happening. It's only recent. My colleagues very uh, cleverly looked at the papers presented to this particular conference, CSCL. So the population is 177 articles and publications. So we did a very quick and dirty type of meta-analysis according to this study. It shows that uh, Tertiary, uh, in terms of what is studied, tertiary learners and K-12 learners are two-thirds of the research. So what, how, where does research take place? Unfortunately, research is taking place elsewhere from Asia-Pacific viewpoint. As you can see, in Asia, only 13%. Are we going to continue to be the receiving end of knowledge and research? So I'm going to ask you, those researchers in the room, you don't have to be come from this reason, but this is the reality, seems to be the reality is the Asian cases are not studied enough in the first place, so this is another way of looking at the unknown, the gray area, if you agree. Okay, so in terms of the process and outcome, according to our, again, quick and dirty meta-analysis, uh, one third is about outcome measured, one third, slightly more than one third is about process, but not necessarily linking between outcome and process. Process just process per se, outcome just outcome. So we don't know as a policy maker, we don't know how these are linked, because from policy we need to know how process input and outcome or result are interrelated, so we can have a better sense of whether money buys anything. In the, in the first place, right? No, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be provocative. But I know. <laughs> okay, so what do Polish circles, people in Polish circles do? They, they are very stringent in, in terms of allocating money to undertake research in the first place. I think one outcome is, I don't say lousy, but uh, we don't get the quality research because there's not sufficient investment. So I'm not going to into the detail. So <clears throat> obstacle is the, the investment in research per se from Polish people. And uh, no, I, this should be self-explanatory. If you have, 
can have time to see my slides, you can see it, get my point. But when the country says that we are looking at outcome, but when we looked into the, the detail, we discovered that they are not looking at learning outcome, they are looking at, Jong-Yi, can you explain what it is? What is defined by outcome? It's not learning. For instance, something like students' view of learning. I don't know whether one can classify that as an outcome. Anyhow, so it is, I would say learning is, is, has yet to be in the foreground in many of these countries. Again, this confirms uh, the one of our bullet points through Back to Learning Forum. Okay, roll-ups, I'm not going to market UNESCO here. UNESCO is about, not is about education for all, but we do lots of things in education. But education for all, as an uh, international agreed goal, is the, the prime of, uh, priority of our mandate. So, as you can see, Millennium Tech, we have eight of them. Two of them are related to education, universal primary education, and then gender parity in education. So we do many things. I'm going to skip these concrete examples here and there. Uh, this is what one of the things we do in UNESCO Bangkok, not UNESCO Paris. We try to focus on teacher education institutions, looking at the leadership, and that learning leadership coming, are you with me? Learning leadership, teaching capacity, and curriculum. So try to link, combine these three elements and trying to help countries to uh, develop what we call e readiness to developing global and national standards to address this issue of learning. Okay, so this is a concrete example, ICT project funded by government Korea. We have a funding from Japan and Korea in these countries. Professor, I wonder if uh, the Hong Kong government can work with us in terms of promoting this agenda, Mr. Chen. We can speak about it later. So, uh, we, have, we have many uh, knowledge platforms. You can uh, visit our website. Um, one thing I would like to mention is, right after this uh, conference, I'm supposed to be in Manila, where we, we will have Ministerial Forum on ICT and Education. This is uh, one of the things that I initiated since I joined UNESCO with uh, my colleague here, Molly Lee and uh, Jong Yi Park. The idea is try to update the, the knowledge of key decision makers in our member states. Because this technology area is ever changing and, and sometimes in a very dramatic fashion, so policy makers need to stay current so that they can make a better decision. This is another way of looking at knowledge or research and policy making. So we are determined to have this each and every year. Hopefully, maybe next year, if Mr. Chen agrees, we can, Hong Kong, we can ask Hong Kong to cause the event with us. So, in conclusion, two points I want to make. By now, uh, we have ample evidence to suggest that ICT technologies bring economic benefits. Of course, there are down, many downsides. Um, from positive side, in education, it clearly expands the learning space, learning opportunities, especially for those who are marginalized for various reasons. So we, sh we should build on this, uh, remembering the one of the uh, bullet points from Back to Learning Forum. Uh, but we, are, uh, we have this challenge, which I would call knowledge gap, where there are many things which we don't know yet, despite all these uh, CSCL uh, researches and studies. So we need to fill the gap. In terms of filling the gap, uh, again, from policy perspective, it would be important for us to identify what we don't know. Do we know enough about why we, we don't know? I think it's, we need to raise this question. The gray area, not known. For example, <clears throat> use of ICT and learning outcomes. This piece of research, as I said, is a puzzle, still a puzzle. So in terms of doing so, I think it's critically important for all of us in the room and beyond 
to communicate amongst us, collaborate amongst us, between practitioners, policymakers, researchers, and to, to uh, pin down what is it that brings quality learning to each and every student, okay? So with that, I will have one suggestion, which is in terms of promoting our uh, mandate, education for all, between now and 2000, we don't have much time. We have to speed up the process to reach the target of reaching the unreached by the year 2000. So I see the ICT can be uh, more than instrumental. So I would like to ask you, academics and researchers, to work with us to, uh, to identify the right technology, right pedagogy, uh, more ethical way of using ICT and innovative ways of measuring new types of skills, 21st skills, etc. So with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Kim. His presentation uh, tempted me to do another PhD thesis, and the title is How a Policymaker Learn. <laughs> we have a, we, uh, the design, Nancy has de so designed this session so that the first Kindle is a little bit more on policies, and, the, and you have uh, more those of the Asian perspectives. So we have Professor Naomi Miyake from Tokyo University, and she's quite known in uh, Japan for a very innovative, authentic learning program spreading from the, in, in the grassroots. Professor Miyake. Thank you, Kaimin, for the nice introduction. And thank you, GJ, for the very clear but honest talks about where we stand on the road of connecting the theory to um, policy and practice, which is the theme of this whole conference. Um, GJ mentioned there also is some gray zones and challenges left for us so that we would be doing better coming out of this uh, community of researchers. I would like to ask you to excuse me to touch upon some of the very local Japanese event we had just to illustrate my interpretation and appreciation of the kind of talk that the JG just gave. On March 11th, as you already know, and you mentally supported us so much, and I, thought, I have to deeply thank for that, that the Japan had experienced a uh, rather unpredictable, uh, we don't like that word, but unpredictable <laughs> so far, uh, devastation about half of our land on which we are still trying to find a better way to cope. But we have already learned a lot, particularly on what kind of ICT situations and the training of using that could have worked or didn't work. Uh, so that was a painful experience, but there were a lot for us to be able to learn because at many of the situations that ICT infrastructure around the school were the only things working functionally in the two, three days to even a week after the devastation, which turned themselves into the information center. Um, but how much it worked depended heavily on the kind of training and experiences that the teachers and the students had had before the devastation. It's so easy for you to imagine we were not expected to get that in some schools, even they had a very beautiful infrastructure, couldn't use much of that capability because the people around there were not trained or were not expecting how they should train themselves for that kind of an occasion. We also learned from this incident that ever stronger need to build a very strong human community, not just the infrastructure around the ICT and networks that we can use. Um, some of those schools lost um, with some regret, um, some kids, 
if we're coming to school, as well as teachers. And to our surprise and deep regret, there were a huge difference among the um, districts on the kind or the devastation they get or the number of casualties that they got. Uh, the differences came from mainly the different procedures that they taught in their evacuation training procedure. In one town, for example, which lost about half of the kids, the kids had been trained well um, to get together on the school's playground before they got evacuated the school. They did that very well, but this procedure just didn't work in that kind of time-pressed um, devastation. The other area, the other district, where a scientist who had himself experienced a relatively severe earthquake in his own lifetime um, made a very different procedure of evacuation process and that they taught the kids to do, this is a Japanese, tendenko, which is a Japanese, I'm sure that most of the Japanese who are here didn't even know <laughs> that it existed, but it's a local uh, Japanese, meaning act on your own judgment. So the kids were trained almost every week to learn this phrase to the depths bottom of their heart so that they were explicitly told to run as hard as possible you can. And if it turned out that you'd be the last person left alive in your family, that's great because you can be the person who can sustain the family tradition. Don't worry about the rest. Living, keeping your left alive is the most important thing in that kind of situation, which they all did. And even they gathered in one sort of an, um, targeted an evacuation spot, and among themselves, the junior high students started to talk about, discuss about whether how safe that spot is, so they decided them on their own judgment that they should be evacuated again to a higher uh, place, which saved most of the kids in the town. The town, in, at the end, lost only five kids. Well, they still lost some of the kids, and as well as some teachers, but uh, the casualty rate was very different. So what could we learn from this kind of experience? Um, could we just say that uh, if they had had a stronger network or community, that each town um, could not have been that different in the a way that they would be acting? That's very difficult to say, because that particular <laughs> um, evacuation procedure was a very strange one for most of the Japanese to think, to prepare kids for the thing which may not come for another 800 to 1,000 years. But still, we, I think, have to face the reality that uniting these different views together and making, creating community, not just the teachers and the students or the children, but to include the seniors of the society as well as the people who are the young and striving members of the society to make our own local culture better so that we can have a very strong, very diverse viewpoint sort of integrated into one strong community of learners on which uh, each Japanese could start learning to do tendenko, uh, to act on their own judgment, to sustain our own culture as well as the Asian culture and the UNESCO culture, maybe, and the international trends that we want to foster in the 21st centuries that we have to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Kim and Professor Chen Kaiming up to the stage. Professor Chen Kaiming will present a souvenir to Dr. Kim. <laughs> 